Greetings, educators. My name is Dr. Washington Collado. I am a Latino that was born and raised in the Dominican Republic in a very, very small town. And that in and of itself gives you a little perspective of life when you go to, uh, when you go from my little village to New York City uh, at the age of, at the age of uh, 13. And I went from a pretty small town to one of the greatest and biggest cities in the world. And today I'm going to talk to you about Latino presence and history in the United States. And that, for some reason, as I went through high school and, and middle school in New York, Latino presence in the United States is reduced to th two things. One, the immigration issue. And two, how many we are. It's like, I call it the multiplication of rabbits. Uh, there's 50 millions and there's 25 millions and like they come in by, it, it's almost a sense that we're coming by the millions and that the lasting presence of Latino does not predate a lot of the uh, British presence in the United States. So we're gonna take a look about that. We're gonna take a look into that. And we're going to take a look at how Latinos have contributed in many ways to the shaping of this land that we call the United States of America in all its richness and its essence. This is a map of the United States and I chose this map to celebrate the presence of Latinos in the United States. And this is also a map of America. So this is a America this is America this particular America is full of flavors from all over the world traditions religions food and that's kind of what this America is also a, a combination of flavors from all over the world what I want to start doing is I'm going to start with a historical perspective to talk about uh, how the United States has evolved in Latinos' presence in it with the very purpose of understanding that Latinos have played a major role, will continue to play a major role, and it is wonderful that it is so. I was listening to Attorney General Bill Barr in an interview that he, uh, he gave to one of the television channels, and he was saying that he was repeating actually a quote from Winston Churchill, which is, history is written by the victors. But then Carol uh, Tavis says that, uh, yes, that although that may be true, but his victim get to write the memoirs. And that would be true in so many ways. That is actually true in so many ways. For instance, this is a picture of the Trail of Tears. If, Hector, if history is only written by the victors, then the history of Native Americans would be just a big old celebration of Turkey and family-friendly uh, exchange between the newcomers and the people that were Aborigines to these lands. So it is not quite so true that victors get to write the history. For instance, this is a map of the United States in 1783, which was really when the independence was consolidated, the periods of war were, were concluded, and now the United States and the 13 colonies uh, were recognized. The part in brown was Spanish territory at that time, yes, including Louisiana. In, 1980, in 1783, Louisiana was part of Spain. So if you think about it, with almost two-thirds of the continental landmass of the United States, at one point or another, in some areas for over 300 years, under, under Spanish rule, whether it's Mexico or Spain, you're going to have a lasting uh, 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 contribution. Now, in different ways. So we're going to go to what it looked like. This is uh, 1789, and the part in 
Ray is uh, is is again controlled by the by Spain. This is 1821. Of course, by now the uh, the Louisiana Purchase has occurred. Here we go. The Louisiana Purchase has has taken place, and now you see the Southwest is uh, Mexico is a fairly large country, and as time continues. This happens. Texas become independent to then become part of the United States. So now if you think about it, Texas becomes part of the United States around the mid 1800s. Previous to that, for over 300 years, Texas was part of Mexico. So Texas had been part of Mexico longer than Texas has been part of the United States. So for many people, for many brown people, the border crossed them. For many architectural richness in the United States, they were left as remnants of that land acquisition. And of course, um, this is the United States in 1853. By then, we had, uh, by we, the United States, we had acquired all that land from Mexico. And uh, you, you see now California and Texas become part of the United States. And this is the United States in 1896. And of course, this is how we know it now. So what happens when that type of land transformation takes place over a period of history. Let's talk about this. One of the first things that we here in Florida get to do is go to St. Augustine, which is the first European settlement in the, in the, in the continental United States, if you will. Um, that is showcasing the, the everlasting traditions and, and architectural uh, 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 contributions of Spanish, in particularly in Florida. And I'm going to go through some very poignant uh, landmarks in the United States that are also Spanish architecture. Here you have Louisiana. Spain uh, controlled the, uh, the territory around Louisiana and of course all the way up uh, further west in marked it with uh, with great architecture this is the alamo alamo and of course the missions in california the missions were ba basically a trail of towns around uh churches that were established missions if you will that were established from south california san diego all the way up uh, uh, to San Francisco area. And there you have all those names still to this day. So when you have this type of architectural design as part of land that was then acquired, you basically have a country that inherited, that was enriched by the people who occupied the, the land before. In the position of land by the newly formed country in the late 1700s came at a truly great price for the, the particularly the Native Americans, but also to other countries that they themselves uh, also took lands from the Native Americans like Mexico and Spain and France and of course Great Britain. Um, but this particular conference, I want to I want to point what has happened because as true as the whole all men are created equal did not mean all men at the time it was what is said and we as a, as time went on we made those words to mean what they truly mean meaning and that's what Dr. Martin Luther King referred to when he talked about as an unfunded check and we still need to push the meaning of those words as educators, as community leaders, 
as, as pushing our kids to believe in the true America that it could become. And this is a great quote that I love from uh, Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. And it is the very fact that when I celebrate myself and I sing myself, and what I assume, you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. So, so that to me, you can interpret however you want, but it means to me that if we validate the culture, the press, and the contributions of our students, of our communities, they will become better American, and we celebrate who we are by celebrating them, by celebrating thoroughly and consistently and with meaningful and with gusto Black History Month, Native American Heritage Month, uh, by celebrating the contribution of women, and of course celebrating the Latino presence in the United States in all its meaning and in, 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 in history. This is Miami. Think of Miami and what it means uh, uh, to the rest of the United States, that tropical flair, the Latino flavor that, that is unapologetic when you, once you enter the city of Miami. From the language to the culture, to the music, to the food, to the traditions, going back so many years. Can you think of Miami without that essence defining it as a city? And of course, if you add to that the great contributions of other uh, uh, cultures like the islands in the Caribbean, particularly Haiti, that has come along to enrich the city of Miami. So going back to this Walt Whitman quote, when we celebrate America into it, what it truly is, we celebrate what we have built together. But we also challenge ourselves in terms of what we could build from here on in. This is um, the diversity uh, in city of Los Angeles. The city, la, la ciudad de Nuestra Señora Reina de Los Angeles. And basically, the also an unapologetic flair for rich Mexican uh, uh, Southwest tradition, from the food to the music to the celebration to the way people worship, to to the names of everything in California. This is New York City. This is New York City, and I love that painting of that trumpet player because New York City to me is music. If you go in through the island of Manhattan, the lower, uh, lower east side, and then you go through Chinatown, Little Italy, going up to Midtown Manhattan, El Barrio, uh, Harlem, and all the way up to uh, Washington Heights where the Dominican community is strong. Then you get into Queens and Brooklyn and, and you get to taste from Guyana to Colombia to, to, to Philippines, to Italy, uh, and in all the sense of the word, can you think of writing New York City history without the contribution of all these groups that made us who we are? That not one should be left out as the victors on call get to write the history. Try writing the history of New York without the Irish, or without the Italian, or without the Latinos or without that uh, black community that, uh, that had as, 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 as the renaissance of, of such great writers such as Langston Hughes and James Baldwin uh, and so much more come out of New York. So when the students, when our students in our schools, if I'm Latino and I go to your school, how do I validate this history I just told you about? How do I validate that? How do I validate that I am also a player in the United States, that I have also contributed, whether I came yesterday or I came in the 500s, uh, 1500s, um, how do I learn about that? So 
This is a map that tells you the concentration of Latinos in the United States. And of course, just like I told you uh, at the beginning, this is consistent with the exception of New York and the, uh, the Northeast. This is pretty consistent with, with how the border crossed a lot of uh, Latinos that came before us. Associate Latinos with the low level positions uh, in, an, in a socioeconomic scale, I want you to know that Latinos, the 57, 59 million Latinos, are bigger than the GDP of India as it relates to the United States. How productive we are to the economy. Here's another interesting little fact. The United States as a Spanish-speaking country is second only to Mexico. Mexico is the only country that has more Spanish speakers within its borders than the United States, followed by Spain, Colombia, Argentina. You see the map. You see the, the thing. So this America, with all its flavors, with all its tastes and colors, is also within the United States of America, and it needs to be celebrated as such. In terms of labor force, Latinos will represent more than 75% of labor force growth in the next eight years. And think about uh, uh, what that means to an economy. That by 2024, one in five workers will be a Latino. In all the fields, from teaching to construction, and hopefully we get, a, we'll, we'll, you know, our schools will continue to do a, a better job. And I'll show you what I mean so that Latinos could take their, their place in the, in, the, in the professions such as teaching and lawyers and doctors and, of course, politicians, representatives and advocating for communities all across the United States. This is um, also true. The Latinos from 15 to 24 are the largest uh, uh, percentage of, of people who drop out of school. They drop out of school more, more than any other race, for different reasons, economic reasons, frustrations, uh, academics, the necessity uh, to work and, and survive, among many, many other reasons that we could get into some other time. Yeah. But what I wanna challenge us to walk away with a question of how are my kids feeling proud of their heritage and their culture as they come into my school? How do they feel part of the fabric of America in the, in the greater extent of the world? This is a picture of my school, Rickards Middle School. And we take pride in ensuring that when it comes to particularly Black History Month and Latino Heritage Month, we make sure that this is not necessarily for Latino or for African Americans, it's for Americans to see the valuable contribution and the valuable treasure that these cultures have represented to the United States. So yes, we dance, we eat, we enjoy the food, we include the community comes out and enjoys it and, uh, and, and, and everybody comes out. Speak the language, eat the food, celebrate the tradition and enjoy the richness of the different cultures that make up Brickard's Middle School. And that is worthy of, of celebrating because that is exactly who we are. In, the, in, 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 in our class, and I'll show it to you in a little bit, Latinos in Action, they get to learn about what this means to them in terms of they are also builder of the United States and the America of tomorrow. Now, let me ask you a question. Do our Latino students in your school, can they relate to Latino grades? Or they just feel like outsiders who are uh, leeching off the great work of others.
that they just they get associated with uh, with the with the taking over and the numbers and the wall and everything else, or can they relate to they themselves building this nation? This is a program that we have at our school by my good friend Jose Enriquez, and what this program does is. As, as high in poverty as Ricketts Middle is, this program teaches them about college potential. It teaches them about how they could contribute back to the community, how they are empowered to, to, to be who they are meant to, to be, which is students of success. I like this picture. Because, not because of Justice Sotomayor, although of course that's one of the reasons that this picture, that that is the reason this picture happened, but because her mother's face in the background there holding the Bible where her daughter is being sworn as Supreme Court Justice of the United States. Do all little girls know that story? The story of that mother practically raising those two kids by herself and, and the trials and tribulations, even as she was going up the uh, ranks to become Supreme Court Justice of the United States, the obstacles she had to overcome and her resilience uh, to become, that will send pride down the heart of every kid that says my name is also a little complicated to pronounce i'm also a latina and i also want to be a lawyer a doctor how is your school representing little sonia's of tomorrow i'm sure that whether it was president bush or clinton or president obama the teachers that were standing in front of them did not know they had a future president sitting in front of them. And if so, would they act differently? Well, you might have a, pre a future president in the, uh, sitting in front of you. This is our friend Richard Carranza. He's the Chancellor of New York City Schools. Uh, one of the group, the biggest school systems in the world, in the in the United States, is being led by a Latino, by a Latino from the Southwest, very proud, and someone who really truly uh, remarkable represents. So I can imagine what these, what what he means to the Latino community in the Northeast, in the in in New York particularly. And I want you to look at this picture of this gentleman. His name. Is Desi Ornes, many know him as Ricky Ricardo, and a lot of people reduce him because he spoke with an accent. But here's what happened in the 60s and the 50s when he was in television, he brought Latino music to the American living room. Latino culture was a big part of the I Love Lucy show, he was one of the brains behind the show. And with his accent, with his, uh, with his uh, allowing himself to, to be made fun of sometimes. Uh, the intelligence of Desi Arnaz and the groundbreaking role that he had for so many Latinos, the elegance, the, the love for his music and his culture uh, was present in American television for the first time in that type of a scenario. This is Senator James Olmos. And he's playing a role there that I love the role that he's playing. He's playing the role of Jaime Escalante in this particular uh, occasion. Jaime Escalante is, was a teacher from California who, unlike many of us, did not see the indicators as a defining factors for their students. Poor with certain academic deficiencies, thinking that those deficiencies were going to limit what they could possibly become in the future. Not Jaime Escalante, he didn't take that for as a defining factor. So he challenged the kids to take calculus 
and they did so well that the uh, that the the, the, the board of, of of exams or the ETS I believe it was called challenged the fact that those kids were able to uh, to achieve at such levels. Check out the movie. It's called Stand and Deliver. It's a great movie of the history of what happens when you believe in our kids, when you empower them with the courage to be who they could be. So take a page from Jaime Escalante, look at the movie if you will, enjoy it, and celebrate uh, actors like Edward James Olmos, who, uh, who has a rich tradition. You know who this lady is? This lady is this lady. Rita Moreno, Puerto Rican, Tony Award, Emmy Award, Academy Award winning actress. With a flair, non-apologetic, very proud Puerto Rican woman who has opened the door for so many that came behind her. And I wonder how you felt when you saw these two Latino women standing in the middle of the, of, of the football field as they celebrated all types of, of rich tradition uh, in music and flair and art. That wouldn't have happened without this. Just like these may open doors in fashion and in industry and art for so many. When you believe in someone, you propel that person to do great things. Pedro Martinez is not a big guy. Five foot ten, maybe five foot eleven, not big, muscular, but someone had believed in him. Someone poured love in him and made sure that he knew he could accomplish great things. When Pedro Martinez took the mound in Yankee Stadium, he owned baseball. I remember it was, I believe, the uh, late 90s. Um, he was, they were celebrating Ted Williams' uh, 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 baseball career, and he started um, the all-star baseball game. He struck out five in this end of time, and he became the MVP that year. Another baseball great, Reggie Jackson. We know him as Reggie Jackson. Do you know that he's Puerto Rican, half Puerto Rican? His name is Reginald Martinez Jackson. Mr. October, number 44, one of the greats of all time, Reginald Martinez Jackson. And of course, the example himself. Also Puerto Rican, but born and raised in Puerto Rico. And one of the great heroes to me and to so many Latinos who love baseball. Roberto Clemente, and another great that uh, that, also, that, that, that also is a trailblazer, Felipe Alou. Known uh, Felipe Alou. So I say all of this to, to as I go to, as I, as, as, I, as I get to my conclusion, is that when your kids are in your school, give them their place in your school. So look at your school population. Look at your district's population and look at the potential to celebrate that you have, but also look at the academics within, within the population and how you can empower your students to be everything that they could be so, so that you don't rely on a, uh, on a magic formula to empower, to provide support, to provide encouragement, to provide tutoring where tutoring means, to provide opportunities for families to get engaged so that your students could tell, uh, tell success stories um, at the end of the day and refer to your school as the place where they discover their full potential because there was someone that cared. Biculturalism and bilingualism is not a bad thing. For those kids who do not speak English, they're not language deficient. They have a potential of a second language. That's different. But if what you put in their head is that they're deficient in English, as poorly as they may speak it at this time, 
you're basically judging their future in terms of what they could be. Provide them all the support that they can, they will be good Americans and they will continue to challenge what's written in the Constitution and in the Declaration of Independence and in the preamble and continue to make us a better nation. So from here to here, there's a lot of history that was written by the victors, that is true. But we get to write the details of the chapters every single day, every single one of us as teachers, as principals, as community leaders. We've been there. Latinos have been there. 60%, 16% of the military is made up of Latino men and women. Look at this chart. That should fill you up with, should fill you with hope. Every single degree in 1991 to 06, 07, and 16, 17, there are more Latinos acquiring and obtaining those degrees. And I remember when I was walking across the stage, when I got my PhD, for some reason, for some reason that I still don't know and actually question, I walked carrying the name of an assistant principal in my mind from, from back in New York that told me that educating people like me was a waste of time. It says I was being uh, uh, walk across the stage, Florida Atlantic University with, uh, with, a, with a PhD. He was in the back of my head. Don't know why, but he was there. Be the other side to that guy. What you, what you made someone believe. Look at this chart. Latino dropout has decreased, which is great. But we're also more likely to go into a two-year college. We're also more likely to drop out of college. We're also more likely not to avail ourselves of scholarships and, 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 and the opportunities to get into college. But here's the thing, with you as a teacher, as an administrator, like President Obama said, we as educators, we are the ones we've been waiting for. And I'm just gonna end with this quote. Change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change we seek. And one of my great heroes, Professor Juan Bosch from, Juan Bosch from the Dominican Republic, what you do matters more than anything you could ever write. What you say matters as well, but what you do matters. What you do in the lives of these kids and these communities matter. Words have the power, he said, to expose an action, but words will never replace actions. Thousands of phrases are incapable of replacing a single action. It truly has been a pleasure speaking with you today. I wish we could, uh, we could do this uh, in the future, get into a dialogue and the dynamics of the type of rich history that, uh, that comes with being an American and the challenge that we have to hold ourselves true to what was written over 200 years ago. To challenge it every time we see that someone is, is shortchanging the meaning of its creed, as Dr. King said. And we as teachers get to do that every single day. Thank you for having me and I hope you enjoyed the conference and we'll get to meet uh, sometime down the future. This is my information um, and I am at your disposal. Good day.